I remember vividly hearing about how we were all born sinful creatures, and that no matter how good you were, you were still a sinful creature just because you were a human being. You had original sin, thanks to Adam and Eve's screw up in the Garden of Eden. Then as we went further into the Bible, after the fall of man, I learned that God brought the flood that wiped out the earth. People turning into pillars of salt, lion's dens, Philistines, fire from the sky, wandering in the desert, frogs, locusts, darkness, killing of the firstborn. I remember thinking, man, Dad's yardstick on my butt has nothing on God. <laughs> God always seems to be punishing here, plaguing there, smoting here, banishing there. I know from these Catholic days, days, I would never have dreamed of having a personal relationship with God. I learned how to fear God. When you're a kid and you hear about how Jesus died on the cross, I was taught that it was because of human sin that Jesus died, which translated into our elementary school brains as, I killed the Son of God. Bottom line was, if you rubbed God the wrong way, you had a one-way ticket down. Down, 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 doobie doo, down, down. <laughs> Not for a while, but forever! as Sister Mary Frances, my second grade nun, used to tell me. <laughs> That's pretty heavy to an eight-year-old, when my biggest fear used to be I was going to be left at the grocery store. <laughs> I remember when the, my fear of the Almighty really reached its apex, when we were preparing to receive our first communion. Now, communion for a Catholic is some serious stuff. We studied in the second grade for months that this blessed sacrament is not the symbolic body of Christ, but the actual body of Christ. Now, imagine this. I'm in second grade, dressed in this powder blue suit, husky, of course, <laughs> with a clip-on tie from Sears. That was an ugly, stinking suit. And I remember sweating for the first time, because if I screwed this moment up, God was going to be so mad. So we were all in line, ready to receive the body of Christ like we had practiced over and over again, with hand over hand, making sure that you took it right away, you didn't even look at it, and you put the host in your mouth. Well, the little boy in front of me dropped it on the floor. <laughs> Immediately after having this happen, there was an unsettling hush, and somebody crying. It was me. <laughs> then a few other kids joined in. When the adults asked us why we were crying, we told them because we were sad, because Jamie dropped Jesus on the floor. <laughs> the adults said that Jesus would be okay, and Jesus would forgive him. It was at that time one of my fellow criers named Lisa, who was the quietest and sweetest in our class, replied with a loud, Nuh-uh, Jamie's going to hell. <laughs> Jamie's reply was to promptly throw up all over my newly purchased brown pair of shoes, also from Sears. Now this seems funny at first, but rather disturbing later, because if this is how we were taught to view God, then what is heaven like? And why in the world would we want to get there if God was going to be at the door like an angry father whose child just came home after curfew? So we turn to scripture for the answers, and sometimes we get it right, but sometimes we get it wrong. In the scripture today, there were two things that hit me as funny and not so funny. In Matthew's gospel, the disciples are gathered at the top of the mountain with Jesus. All of them. They worship him. But here's the kicker of the whole thing, and it stuck out like a red thumb. And join in with me if you want, but some doubted. What a reflection on humanity. Here were the same guys that were called by Christ, heard him teach, ate with him, talked with him, walked countless miles with him, saw him arrested, crucified, buried, and now here he was, right in front of them. And they still doubted? Come on, guys, what's it going to take? But sometimes aren't we just in the same boat as those early Christians? I mean, the crux of our faith revolves around the resurrected Christ. Yet, there are still those in the faith who question the center of the faith. Of course, our minds sometimes cannot grasp the awesomeness of God working in our lives. It, it, it wasn't until I um, recently that I was recommended a book, and it really changed the, 
perception I view the Trinity and God working in our lives. And it's called the shack. I didn't know if anybody in here has heard of it, read it, or seen it. I really wish I would have read it earlier and joined the Bible study group that was uh, hosted here. But I wanted to read just a little bit of this because this part really hit home for me. In the story, the main character, Mackenzie, is having a private conversation with God. And God, in the book, tries to define who he is. He says, the problem is that many folks try to grasp some sense of who I am by taking the best version of themselves, projecting that to the nth degree, factoring in all the goodness they can perceive, which often isn't much, and they call that God. And while it may seem like a noble effort, the truth is that it falls pitifully short of who I really am. I'm not merely the best version of what you can think of. I am far more than that, above and beyond all that you can ask and think. That really hit a nerve with me. I think that's why the author of the chat basically told us why we have a hard time believing sometimes. I want you to think of the most joyous times in your life and the most difficult. And in all those moments of how you define God, at those times, don't we label God as a punisher or a protector? An avenger? A father or a friend? Sometimes I think we forget that we are created in God's image. But instead, how many times have we created God in our own? Then as we skip over to the book of Acts, I knew I'd include this into our reading this day. I can imagine these guys kind of looking up at the sky. And finally, two angels almost coming up to them and going, Guys, come. He'll be back. Don't worry. Come on. Holy Spirit's coming. Let's go. Let's go. We've got work to do. As a teacher, I'm always saying the same thing to the same kids over and over again as they wander down the hall looking at the sky or their friends and they don't look where they're going. Watch where you're walking or walk where, walk, excuse me, walk where you're watching or watch where you're walking. Aren't there some times where God has sent the answer to a problem that is right there in front of our face but we keep looking to the sky for help? People need our help and they're right there in front of our face. Forgive me if I give an oversimplification to the current economic situation in this country. And if I can get an amen out of somebody who agrees with what I'm about to say. How can there be so much unemployment when there is so much work to do? <laughs> so in conclusion, there's still this question of what the last thing Jesus told us to do before he was taken to heaven. Every so often I think of our cute and soon to be retired Pastor Terry. And he said something in his sermons that makes me think. I remember a few sermons ago, he said something to the effect that, I would have never met you if it weren't in the faith that we share. I think about those words, I never would have met you if it weren't in the faith that we share. And then I think of all of you in our relationship. Now in some of your cases, I'm nothing more than a face in the balcony, recording the music and the sermons. Or the guy who pesters you with a weekly email with a link to our website. In others, I'm a guy that sings in this fantastic choir. To others, I was a teacher in your class about marriage. A traveling companion to Kansas City. A bell ringer. A staff <coughs> member. I'm a husband. A father. Or maybe I'm blessed enough that you call me your friend. But to all of you, first and foremost, I am your brother in Christ. And I think that's the fulfillment of Jesus' great commission. Let us pray. For our prayer today, I'd like you to try something a little different. You can keep your eyes closed, but instead of bowing your head, maybe you can lift your face towards the sky. And maybe instead of keeping your hands folded, we can open them and place each palm facing upward in our laps. It is during this time I'd like to offer a prayer not of petition and not of thanksgiving, but of reflection. I want you to think of all the blessings that God has given you, your strengths, your talents, your attitude towards other people. And I want you to think of all the lives you have touched and that have touched you. 
Then I want you to imagine what your last words would be to one or more of those people you love. It might be to a person you haven't even met yet. And think of what you would say. And then ask yourself, if what I have to say is so vital to the enrichment of my life and that other person's life, then why haven't I said it yet? Amen.